Okay, the reading for tonight from Matthew 5, King James Version. Dake's headings for this chapter include Sermon on the Mount, number one, an introduction, number two, the eight Beatitudes, number three, section three, similitudes of believers, or in other words, qualities that converted brethren should show and have. Number five, laws of the kingdom, big A, they are as binding as the law of Moses, big B, they transcend the law of Moses, section A, on murder, section B, on restitution and prayer, section C, on civil suits, section D, on committing adultery, section E, on divorce and remarriage, Divorce often follows adultery. Number uh, and F, I shouldn't be laughing about that, but F on making vows, G on retaliation, H on love. And the chapter ends with a goal that we should all have when we get to verse 48. Let's begin, beginning in verse 1, Sermon on the Mount, introduction. And seeing the multitudes... He went up into a high um, he went up into a mountain and when he was set his disciples came unto him now from another parallel verse we'll see that he was sat and in other words he was he sat down he was seated on this mount John 6:3 the parallel verse for this in the gospel of John and Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now, you'll notice it does not describe which mountain or the view he had from there. And there's a lot of speculation about which mountain he was seated on there with his disciples. But we do know it's not, we know that Matthew 24 is expressed about Another time when he sat upon the Mount of Olives and his disciples came unto him privately. In this other case, we'll back up to it and you'll see that uh, in verse 1 of Matthew, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. Now, either the multitude could hear him from the mountain or... He was escaping from them. But, you know, you can talk from a high place and people below you can hear you. Verse 2, And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, and we're going to cut over to Luke chapter 6 and verse 17 for this supporting scripture, And he came down with them and stood in the plain, and the company of his disciples, and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem, and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him, and to be healed of their diseases. So they people come out to listen to him and be healed. Now verse 3 of Matthew 5, Blessed, this begins the eighth, the section on the eight Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Oh, some of you say, well, looky there. Here's a verse shows we go to heaven. No, it doesn't. It just shows ownership that the kingdom these people inherit is of heaven. It comes out of heaven, but it comes down here to this earth, and we'll show you a parallel. You'll, find, you'll see a parallel verse here in these Beatitudes. It shows you somebody inherits the earth. Let's take a look. We'll get there. Let's take a look at the next one in chapter 5, verse 4. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. You know, even Jesus Christ had tears for the things that he would see around him. Verse 5, blessed are the meek. Now notice the difference here, for they shall inherit the earth. Let's go back to verse 3 where we see, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the poor in spirit get the kingdom of heaven. And then look uh, 
what the meek is. They inherit the earth. They shall inherit the earth. Same difference because the kingdom of heaven is coming to this earth when Christ returns, having already qualified to usher in and restore that kingdom after having beat Satan the devil in the supreme battle for world rulership. That battle is over and done. Now, God has left Satan on the throne of this earth as the god of this world, the prince of the world, the prince of the earth. And that's, oh, But that's only until Jesus Christ returns, having again already qualified to take over the throne of Satan. But they're giving Satan a little time to have that throne a little longer and to influence men for the 6,000-year period that God set up for all that. All right, so the meek inherit the earth. Let's go on now to verse 6 of Matthew 5. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And we'll take a look at our supporting verse, John chapter 7, verse 37. Um, supporting in the sense that it talks about thirst. And in the, it speaks of in the last day, that great day of the feast. Now, it's actually the eighth day of the feast. It's a separate feast all by itself, but it begins immediately as the last day, the seventh day of the feast ends of the Feast of Tabernacles. And as we've referred to it from this verse as the last great day. Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. The last great day is the period of time that we've called the 100-year period from Isaiah 65 that follows the 1,000-year millennium that the Feast of Tabernacles pictures. And this verse applies to that 100-year period after the 1,000-year millennium, during the time which the second resurrection has occurred, and the billions of people that lived and never were called are now called, and Christ in regard to that. And right now, only John 6.44, John 6, John 6.65, only those who the Father draws can come to Christ. A spring harvest, a smaller harvest. But come second resurrection, if any man thirst, there will no longer be a division between man and God that requires an exception being made by the Father drawing some of us to the spring harvest. It'll be the fall harvest. The door is wide open. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. All right, we'll go now to back to verse 7 of Matthew 5. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You reap what you sow. Verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. God doesn't let an uncleanness look upon him. Look at this verse in 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. As God's end time apostle Herbert Armstrong once well put it, he said, in the spirit and the dynamics of the spirit, all things are new. And it comes from this verse, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. He wasn't just making up something. The old things become new. Here it says the old things are passed away, behold, but behold, all things are become new. John 13, 11, verse 11 is a supporting verse. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, you are not all clean. Cleanness and purity go hand in hand. And blessed are the poor in spirit. Let's go back there for a quick second and see what they get. Let's see. Where, where, what happened? 
Let's see, here's the one that says, Blessed are the, the merciful, for they shall obtain. Mercy, here it is. Blessed are the pure, the clean, the pure in heart, the clean in heart, for they shall see God. All right, that means they're converted because the flesh cannot see God, but spirit can. Verse 9, Matthew 5, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Innocent little children making peace. Once in a while the kids can get rowdy, but you correct them. They start the correction early. They usually correct easy. Verse 10, Matthew 5, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven same thing as in verse 3 blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven so you got the poor in spirit you've got they which are persecuted for righteousness sake inheriting the kingdom of heaven theirs is the kingdom of heaven now, verse 11, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil, evil against you falsely for my sake. And verse 12, rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now, verse 13, you are, this is a new section on the qualities or similitudes of believers, as they heads this section. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. And we've got a supporting verse in Mark 9 and verse 50. Salt is good, says this verse. Christ says in this verse, salt is good. But if the salt have lost his saltness, well, it's no longer salt anymore. If it's not salty, wherewith will you season it? If it's got no seasoning taste to it, how are you going to season things? Have salt, in, 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 and then Christ goes on to give this instruction. Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. Another supporting verse is in Luke chapter 14, verse 34, saying almost the same thing. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his, his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? If there's no seasoning taste in it, how can you call it seasoning or salt? Back to Matthew 5 and verse 14. Now you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Verse 15, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. We cut back to chapter 4 of Matthew, verse 16, for some support. The people which sat in darkness during the time that Jesus Christ was here in the flesh saw great light in Jesus Christ. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, this verse says, light is sprung up, the light of Jesus Christ. Now, verse 16 of Matthew 5, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. There's two things going on there, and here's a supporting verse for one of them. Exodus 25, verse 31 says, And you shall make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knops and his flowers shall be of the same. And verse 6 of Exodus 25, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense. Then verse 20 of Exodus 27, and you shall command the children of Israel that they bring 
you pure oil olive or pure olive oil beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. And then we go to another supporting verse, this one in John chapter 14, verse 12. Truly, truly, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father, who Christ has explained elsewhere, is greater than Christ, greater than himself. Verse 17 now of Matthew 5. Think not. Now this is under the heading that Dake prescribed for this that says, Christ came to end the law. However, the very first verse under this section, Mr. Dake says, think, Christ speaking, saying, think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And as God's end time apostle has explained this, to make the law even fuller. And he's going to explain himself here in a moment. We have the screen back up. In verse 18, ah, come on here. Oh, we're going to cut away to a supporting verse first. In uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Christ said, Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he, but those who do enter are, or is he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Father in heaven, we do his will. And verse 61 of Matthew 26, and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Verse 18 of Matthew 5, for tr truly, verily, I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Supporting verse in the eighth chapter of Matthew at verse 17, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sickness, our sicknesses, plural. And this one should be telling us that Healing is still available to us today, Christ having taken the infirmities of 39 stripes just before he was crucified, saying that by his stripes we are healed, it means us today, not the people living in Christ's time, because he didn't take those stripes and, until just before his death. So that could not have, those stripes could not apply to people during Christ's lifetime here on the earth while he was going around healing people. Those stripes for healing are for the rest of us. Of course, those who were healed, look, you know, there was a looking forward to when Christ would take those stripes, but he had to do it, and he did it. And he, he did it without quitting. Matthew 13, chapter 35, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I'll open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. All right, there's some, there's a prophecy being fulfilled. Hebrews 7, 11, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there or would there be that Another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron. Perfection, Hebrews 7. He, and back to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verse 19. Christ says, Whoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Doesn't mean he'll be there <laughs> when he's spoken of. He'll be called the least. But whosoever shall do and teach 
these commandments. Whosoever, whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. We go to a supporting verse in James 2, verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. He's just as good. He might as well have broken every single one of them if he breaks one at all. Another supporting verse in Luke chapter 7, verse 28. For I say unto you, um, Christ speaking, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. We're going back to verse 20 of the Sermon on the Mount. Christ says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Got a big job on our hands, folks. Verse 21, you have heard that it was said by them of old, old time, it was said by them in the past, those before us, you shall not kill. That word actually should be rendered murder. You shall not murder. And whosoever shall murder or kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, here's where that verse about thou shall not kill or murder comes from. In the Old Testament, it's in two, at least two places. Exodus 20, verse 13, thou shall not kill, thou shall not murder. The original Hebrew word there means murder, murderous acts. And the same word is used here, thou shall not kill, that should be rendered, thou shall not murder, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 17. 22nd verse of Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, Christ says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause. Now, there's a little catch here. It's not just whoever's angry with his brother, but whosoever is angry, angry with his brother for no reason at all, I mean without a cause to it, shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever Whosoever shall say, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. We better be careful in our attitudes toward others. Love them. Supporting verse in chapter 7 of Matthew, verse 29. For he, Christ, taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So behind what Jesus Christ was teaching, there was not just hot air, fancy words, he had, he taught as one having authority in what he taught. And he contrasts that with the scribes saying, not as the scribes who don't teach with authority. A supporting verse, or one, and it makes a little bit of a contrast, is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, where we're told by Paul, speaking to the Ephesians and all the rest of us in this age, be you angry, but sin not. Be you angry and sin not. You got to keep it both in there. You got to, when you're angry, you got to sin not. Let and let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Don't don't <laughs> don't carry it overnight so it's going to boil and and become worse than it really is, or worse than it should be. All right, now verse 23 of the Sermon on the Mount at Matthew 5. Therefore, Christ said, if you bring your gift to the altar, we're picking up from verse 22 where he had said, I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka. Hang on a second. Let me see if I can find a reference to Raka. Yeah, here I've got one... Um, an Aramaic word of utmost contempt and scorn as English. You scoundrel, you wicked rascal, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, 
you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. All right, so now we've, we've got that context in verse 22, and verse 23 gives a therefore. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and, there's, and while you're there at the altar with your gift, you remember that your brother has aught against you. Your brother's got something against you. Verse 24 tells us, Leave there your gift before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Verse 25, Matthew 25, continuing the Sermon on the Mount, Christ tells us to agree with our adversaries quickly. Agree with your adversary quickly, thine adversary quickly, while you are in the way with him lest at any time the adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge deliver you to the officer and you be cast into prison. Not a hot, not a wonderful thing to happen to you. Now, see, what that was verse 23. Now verse, wait a minute, something went wrong there. Let's see, what? Oh, you know, somehow we got a verse out of order a moment ago because we had verse 25 up there about being cast into prison. What happened to those verses? Yeah, verse 25 of Matthew 25, and the next verse is verse 26. Okay, did we read the ones before verse 25? Uh, yeah, we did. We skipped something there somehow. All right, we just said if you, if you know while you're at the altar with a gift that your brother has something against you, you need to leave your gift at the altar and go be reconciled with your brother, as verse 24 of Matthew 5 says. We go to Matthew 18, 15 for instruction about what to do if your brother has trespassed against you. Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Don't go to the ministry first. Don't go to other f brothers first or sisters, or both, go to the man directly, alone. Now, if he shall hear you, you've gained your brother. Now, there is one instance where you might go to a brother or even a minister, but without revealing who you're talking about, and you got to be real careful there, because otherwise you're, not, you're violating this instruction if you go mention the person's name. But you could mention the situation if you're not absolutely positive and you haven't got the beam out of your own eye, you could go explain a situation without saying who's involved so you could get some wise counsel if you need it. And maybe in that process of getting counsel, you find out you were in the wrong or that you had some even bigger wrong somehow. But if you clearly know you're in the, in the right and your brother has offended you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone if he hears you, you've gained your brother. Now, if you're right and he doesn't hear you, then what you do is not go to the ministry yet. You take one or two more lay members with you. But if he will not hear you, verse 16 of Matthew 18, if he will not hear you, then take with you one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. All right, now, what happens if he still doesn't hear that gang you brought along with you, one or two others? Verse 17 covers that. And if he shall not, and if, and if he shall neglect to hear them, then you can run to the ministry. Then tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto you as a heathen man and a publican, like an infidel, a heathen. Now, verse 25, agree with your adversary quickly while you're in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge deliver you to the officer and you be cast into prison. Verse 26, truly, verily, I say unto you, you shall by no means come out thence. You, know, you won't come out of that prison until you have paid the uttermost farthing. So agree quickly. Verse 27, you've heard that it was said by them of old time, you shall not commit adultery. Verse 28, 
But I say unto you that whosoever looks on a woman. Now, here is what Christ meant by think not that I'm come to destroy the law, but I've, I've, I've not come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. He's made it even fuller. You can't even look on a woman to lust after her. Before Christ come, I guess the fellows could look and lust as long as they didn't hop in the sack with her and vice versa, so you women. But here Christ is saying, and you women have to, or the, the counterpart of this is you should be dressing modestly and not slamming your face full of colored mud. That whosoever looks on a woman to lust, like Jezebel did, to attract sexual interest in her. But I say unto you, Christ says, that whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And that's you just broke you just broke the commands, and you're as good as have broken them all. You've earned yourself the death penalty. And to repent, you gotta put Christ through those stripes and crucifixion all over again. We need to think about how serious sin is, brethren, before we go jumping off the side of a cliff to just easily commit sin. Verse 29, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. And if your right eye offend you, plug it out and cast it from you. Now, this is symbolic. It means take it serious. For it's profitable for you. It's, it's also literally true, too. But, you know, you can get a hold of yourself figuratively and not literally have to do this. But Christ does say it's profitable for you that you that one of your members should perish and not that the whole body should be cast into hell, into Gehenna, the Gehenna fire, the lake of fire. That's the end of this age. Verse 30, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. And if your right hand offend you, cut it off, cast it from you. For it's profitable for you that one of your members should perish and not that your whole body should be cast into Gehenna, to hell. All right. That's important enough that Christ repeated it here. Verse 31, it's been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Verse 32, but... I say unto you, Jesus Christ saying unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife except for the cause of fornication, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced commits adultery. Okay, divorce pretty serious business. Better think long and hard about it before you do it. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 10, is an exception for brethren. And unto the married, Paul to the Corinthians and to all the rest of us says, I command you, I, I command, yet not I, but the Lord. He's speaking on behalf of Jesus Christ. Let not the wife depart from her husband. Verse 11, 1 Corinthians 7, but and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And let not the husband put away his wife. Verse 12, but to the rest speak I and not the Lord. Now, he had this authority from God to be able to set some doctrine on his own. And he made a point of saying, look, this is, <laughs> this is contrary to what Jesus Christ spoke. But Christ is allowing me to do this, to make this exception under these particular circumstances. But these are, should be rare circumstances because God only calls the few. And he's giving a little favor to the few that he called here in this. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 12. If any brother has a wife that believes not, you got an unconverted wife, but she's pleased to dwell with you, well, you're stuck with her, bub. Let him not put her away. 
I don't know why I say stuck with her. Hopefully you loved her when you married her and you still love her, even though you got called and she didn't. You know, keep the love going there. Keep that love you had. No reason to get rid of that. You know, she may not, not be happy that you're not attending the same church with her anymore, but do everything else just like you did and show that wonderful, loving, loving, loving love. And you won't be able to share certain spiritual things, but... So what? You got that love. There are some people in the church have no mate at all. Verse 13, and the woman which has a husband that believes not, uh, where a woman's got an unconverted man, an unconverted husband, and if he's pleased to dwell with her, let her not depart from him. You can't run off and start having affairs with brothers in the church, women, and divorce your husband so you can have your little multiple flings with brothers in the church. No, if you got a husband, he's pleased to dwell with you and he's become unconverted or was never called and converted yet. Uh, but he's pleased to have you there. Uh, you're stuck with him. Let her not leave him. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be putting out so rough, but you're stuck with him. But, you know, I'm having a little bit of fun with it here. Verse 14, 1 Corinthians 7, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by his converted wife and and vice versa the unbelieving wife the unconverted woman the unconverted wife is sanctified by her husband that means the husband or the wife married to a converted the unconverted husband or wife married to a converted mate is not cut off from god the way the rest of the world is and by the converted person's conduct that unconverted mate not being cut off could, could, could come on into the body of Christ because they're not cut off the way the rest of the world is. Same thing applies to church kids, to 1 Corinthians 7 kids, as it says at the end of verse 14, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy because they have at least one parent who's a believer, who's been called and chosen and is presently a part of the body of Christ, presently has God's Holy Spirit dwelling in them, and they are following that Spirit. Now, a supporting verse in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, when a man has taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes because he's found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. Now, I'm just covering the bases. When you want to know everything about a given subject, you got to look up every single verse of Scripture that relates to that subject. And this is just one of many that relates to divorce marriage, remarriage, etc. Isaiah 50, chapter 50, verse 1, Thus saith the eternal Lord God, Where is the bill of your mother's divorcement, whom I have put away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities have you sold yourselves, and for your transgressions is your mother put away. For your transgressions is your mother put away. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 8, And I saw when for all her, all, for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away. And I, and, and I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. After backsliding Israel, house of Israel, committed adultery, and God and, and 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 the house of Judah saw God put her away, the house of Israel. Then, instead of fearing and steering clear of that wrong, treacherous sister Judah feared not and went and played the harlot also. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 3. Therefore, the showers, we're backing up to verse 3, the showers have been withholden, and there's been no latter rain, and you had a whore's forehead. 
you refused to be ashamed. A whore can commit iniquity and whoredom, and her face shows no shame. Uh, that is shameful. But you won't see that shame on the face of a whore. Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount, back to it with verse 33. Again, Christ says, You've heard that it has been said of them of old time, You shall not forswear yourself, but shall perform unto the Lord your oaths. But I say unto you, verse 34, Christ says, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it's God's throne, Verse 35, or Leviticus 19.12, in support, And you shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shall you profane the name of your God. I am the eternal Lord your God. Numbers 30, verse 2, If a man vow a vow unto the eternal Lord God, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 21. When you shall vow a vow unto the eternal Lord your God, you shall not slack to pay it. For the eternal Lord your God will surely require it of you, and it would be sin in you. Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, verse 35 now, nor by the earth, swear not, not, not by the earth either, for it is God's footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great King, our coming Lord and Master, King, Jesus Christ. Verse 36, neither shall you swear by your head, because you can't make one hair white or black. You don't have control over your own head. <laughs> Verse 37, Matthew 5. But let your communication or your conduct and your words be yea, yea, nay, nay, yes or no. For whatsoever is more than these comes of evil. James 5, verse 12 in support, But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any, neither by, uh, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, your yes be yes, and your nay, nay, no, no, lest you fall into condemnation. Now, verse 38 of Matthew 5, Christ says, You've heard that it has been said, An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But, oh, oh, and here's, here's, here's where that comes from. Exodus chapter 21, verse 24. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. It goes on, verse 25, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. If you want to see that, Exodus 21 is full of all that stuff. But we're going to go to Leviticus 24, verse 20 now. Breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he has caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done to him again. You mess somebody else up, you're going to get messed up exactly the same way. God teaching in a very physical way that we reap what we sow. Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 21. And your eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. You kill somebody, you get put to death. And God, God says, your eye shall not pity. No mercy on it. But, ah, no, that was in the old covenant. But in the, under Jesus Christ in the Melchizedek priesthood. Here we go. Verse 39, but I say unto you, Jesus Christ saying unto you, that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. 
Now, would that mean if a couple of thieves break into your house at night, and as the old covenant says you can do, you can kill them if they break in in the dark at night? But here Christ is saying, but I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite you on your right cheek, they come in and steal all your stuff, turn to him the other also. Open up the other drawers for him. Yeah, unlock the other doors. I, now I'm going a little far with that, but, you know, you got to think this through and do this in prayer and be convicted in your own mind about it. Verse 40, Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount. And if any man will sue you at law and he takes away your coat, gets a judgment against you and he levies on your property. Well, he levies your coat, let him have your cloak also. God is saying, no biggie, I'll take care of you. Verse 41, Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount. And whosoever shall compel you to go a mile, go with him twain. Now this is under the old civil law of governments that would require people from time to time to help them with the distribution distribution of mail and, and other things, other needs the government has. Here's a note from Dake on it. What one can afford with justice to the family and personal obligations. Let's see. Okay, oh, oh, this is what I want right here. A reference to the custom of forced service in transport by a king's courier could not who, uh, let's see, what is it? Who could a reference to the custom of forced service, forced service, and transport and transport by a king's courier, who that courier could demand the service of others to carry out the king's business. To refuse, Dakes adds and says, to refuse was an unpardonable offense to the king. So if the king's courier says you got to help. With the king's business, you better get busy. All right. Uh, 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 supporting scriptures here for this verse. Matthew chapter 27, verse 32. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. Here's an example of forced service. They compelled a man to bear his cross. Here's another verse likened to that in Mark 15, verse 21. And they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus. They, uh, they compelled him to bear his cross. Okay, and then back to Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount, verse 42. Christ says, give to him that ask you. And from him that would borrow of you, turn you not away. 1 Timothy 5, verse 8, for support. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own mouth, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel, a rank unbeliever. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Christ says here, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running, all, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto, into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet, Withal, it shall be measured to you again. You got a giving heart? Hey, God's going to respond and give to you. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which sows bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 9, Every man according as he is purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. I'm just going to ask you, are any of you holding back your tithes? Find a faithful minister and give to God through that 
Melchizedek order of today. Verse 8, 2 Corinthians 9, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. And 1 John chapter 3, verse 17, But whosoever has this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shuts up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwells the love of God in him? Back to Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount, verse 43. Christ says, you've heard that in, it, it's been said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That comes from Leviticus 19 and verse 17. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall in any wise rebuke your neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. You see your neighbor doing a wrong, you need to rebuke him. Otherwise, you're suffering sin upon him. That sin's going to eat him up and it'll eat you up. Whew! All right, you better rebuke him. You better rebuke them. You need to do it. Matthew chapter 22, verse 39. And the second great command is like unto the first. The second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I heard a man in a sermon one time say that nowhere in the Old Testament did it say you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I had to go show him Leviticus 19.17. I think, I think that's where it was. Was it? Let's see. Uh, it says that in principle, you shall not hate your brother. You, you shall not, you shall in any wise rebuke him and not let him suffer sin. There is a, there, it is in there though. You love your neighbor as yourself. It's in the old covenant. But this verse in support, Luke chapter 10, verse 27. And he, Christ answering said, you shall have, you, uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. That's New Testament, New Covenant, Luke 10. Here in Exodus 17, verse 14, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And a little more on Amalek, verse 15, Exodus 17. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah Nisi. For he said, because the eternal Lord God has sworn that the eternal Lord God will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. The point of these verses is this. you got to love your fellow man. And if he's done something wrong, you... Let the Lord rebuke the person. You can call upon the Lord to rebuke the person, but you be careful. Deuteronomy 7, verse 1, When the eternal Lord your God shall bring you into the land which he's given to possess it, uh, when he brings you into the land where you go to possess it, and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites and the Gergesites, the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hevites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. When God brings you in there, when you go in to possess it, guess what he's going to do? And when the eternal Lord your God shall deliver them before you, you shall smite them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show any mercy, nor show mercy unto them. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 3, and an Amorite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the eternal Lord God, even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the eternal Lord your God forever, forever. Now that's God's rebuking. 
but let, let God do it. Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount, verse 44, but I say unto you, love your enemies. You love your enemies. Let God rebuke them. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Verse 45, for he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. And eventually the unjust are going to be like the old Saul turned to Apostle Paul. And it's God's will that none perish, although there will be some obstinates. Verse 46, Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount. Christ said, for if you love them which love you, what reward have, have you? You love them that love you? Yeah, even don't even the publicans do the same? Christ asked wisely. Supporting verse in chapter 9 of Matthew, verse 11, and when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, why eat your master with publicans and sinners? Why does he sit down and eat with those sinners? Matthew 11, verse 19, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. Matthew 21, verse 31, whether of them which of the two, whether of them twain did the will of his father? Which of the two of these guys did the will of his father? They say unto him, the first. Jesus said unto them, truly, I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Christ was making a comparison here of some who claim to be righteous, and yet they didn't do what they told others to do. And so God says, the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you who claim righteousness. All right, verse 47 of Matthew 5. Did I miss a verse? Let's look back here for just a second. No, that's the one. Okay, just had it in here twice. Verse 47 of Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount. And if you salute your brethren only. Now, we are to put brethren on a high pedestal. There's a verse that tells us to do that. But it says, if you salute your brethren only. Well, what do you do more than others? Do, do not even the publicans do so? But the last verse of this chapter 5 of Matthew, a verse we all should have as a goal for ourselves, verse 48. But you, therefore, be you, therefore, perfect, or become you perfect. Be you, therefore, perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Once in a while you hear a person say, well, I'm not perfect. I don't even claim to be perfect. You know, in other words, I'm going to make some mistakes, commit some sin. But it should be our goal to not make mistakes or make commit sin and to not take it so lightly either. Not be saying, I'm not perfect. Well, everybody's going to know you're not perfect, even if you're trying to be perfect. But here Christ says you should be trying to be perfect. He says, not just trying, he says, do it. Be you, therefore, perfect. Be perfect. Even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Now, that's a pretty high target, a pretty high mark, a high goal to set for yourself and achieve. Be you perfect. Be you, therefore, perfect even as perfect as your Father which in, is in heaven is perfect. And that's the end of chapter 5. Your host here, Stephen Lloyd Gilbert, saying so long. Until next time, we'll go into Matthew 6.